Okay. The, the talk tonight is going to be a little bit disorganized because I've been reading these cases from this last term and I'm trying to find a pattern of alignments and arguments and attitudes and positions and doctrines and I'm just telling you this. Um, and I've been watching that court for a lot of years. I don't get a pattern yet. There's a kind of negative feeling about the whole court but in terms of what, what they're deciding, but in terms of the judicial craft, I haven't really identified them all yet. And I think it's probably true that most Supreme Courts, when you add two or three new people, it takes a couple of years for people to kind of get settled into that who's who, who can do what, what you can get away with, what you can't get away with, who will go to the opera with you and who won't. Uh, and after that settles for a couple of years, you begin to be a little bit more able to predict alignments and positions and stuff. But this is, a, to me, a, a basket case of different people, some new ones, some been around a while, with different attitudes and different perspectives, and they haven't sorted it out for themselves yet. And that makes us outside observers um, kind of in doubt. So, uh, as I worked through these cases, I, I couldn't come up with much in the way of a pattern. I wish I had one. I could say, well, they're always going to do this, they're always going to do that and somebody will always disagree with somebody else and so on. I don't have that information yet, it'll take a couple of years. <clears throat> One thing I think that is uh, visible, I think, in the, in the opinions, and that is they're starting to talk about each other a little more. Sometimes um, there's some comments now in the opinion that, in a majority of opinions, well, the dissent says we're not doing this right, and, but you know, they're just wrong about this. And the dissent will say, well, the majority opinion is just off, off the rails. <clears throat> and that kind of personal, it's not sniping really, they're always, almost always respectful. Um, but it's something that I'm not used to either from, from the last eight or 10 years when I've been looking at these. So there may be a little personal anxiety, a little personal hostility or adversariness or something in the mix there, then we'll have to sort of let that sort out. Because you will know the way the court was composed was most unusual. And uh, for partisans, it was a horrendous thing if it was your party that got eased out. And if, if, if your party got eased in, you think it was a wonderful thing. You know, what Mitch McConnell did and all that. So there's just, there's some feelings there that I'm a little sensitive to. But I haven't seen enough of it to be able to give you any real inside scoop about it, but we'll see maybe in the future we'll do that. Well, I, I went down the list, you know, they get about 8,000 petitions for served every year, and they pick the cases they want. They, only can, they can only decide 60 or 70. So they decide 60 or 70 out of this population of 8,000 cases. So it's an appellate court, and in theory, they don't have to take any case mostly they don't want. But having that range to select from, they pretty well pick their case. They know what they want to talk about this year. They know what they don't want to talk about this year. And they can fairly well manage that in this process. So I think we've got 65, 70 cases. And we have time tonight for you know three or four, perhaps. So I can't, I, I do the same kind of selecting they do. And I've, I've got several of them that we're going to talk about that I think are important cases, not only because of the design, but because um, they begin to give us some clues about what the, what the court's going to do. Okay, and now the, oh, the, the hush falls over the house. <laughs> uh, I expect somebody to stand up with a benediction or something. <laughs> so let me just go down. What I said in the, in the elevator announcement, um, we're going to talk about, I think there are five cases in that list. Um, and let me start off with the first one, which I think is really an interesting case. This is this, the federal student loan program uh, case that said the president did not have authority to, to adopt that program. So it was a program, as you may remember, this whole thing with student loans, it's a huge business. One and a half trillion dollars worth of outstanding loans. And uh, 
millions and millions of students. So this is a big item, a big number item. And what happened, of course, was all authorized under a 1965 statute, uh, which authorizes the president to set up this loan program. And so what happens is 9-11. And all of a sudden, these people, you know, there was a national emergency and everything was falling apart. And somebody said, we got to do something to postpone the payment of these loans for a while. So that was done. And then the president who followed that president, Mr. Trump, um, he continued that postponement for a little while. Um, and then it ran out, and then another president was in by that time. And, uh, and so it's been a very complicated thing. If you, were, if you, if you own to have any student loans, any of you here, or maybe children or grandchildren, great-grandchildren who have them, you may have been a little doubt when the payments are due, <laughs> because there have been postponements and they've been stopped, they've been started again. And when it came around the last time, President Biden, in, in response to a, uh, a campaign promise, he didn't just postpone them. He essentially canceled uh, 10000 or $20,000 worth of student loans for millions of low-income borrowers. And so that was a major, major change. And so that's what's being litigated here, whether he had authority to do that. And remember, we talk about the president and the imperial presidency and all that stuff, but the president can't do very much outside of international affairs without explicit authorization from Congress. So this is what he's doing here, and the Secretary of Education is doing in setting up these programs is following a congressional grant of authority to them to do this. And so the question always is, does that authority extend to this particular kind of act? And if not, good loans may be good, loans may be bad, the court doesn't care. The court wants to know if it's authorized. Did the president have authority from Congress to do this? And so the court is not thinking as a legislative body would about are loans a good idea, should we have more, should we have less, should we have longer periods, lower interest rates, whatever. That's not the court's job. The court's job is to look at the statute and see whether the statute authorized the president to adopt this program. So now, it's, some of you say, that's why I, I didn't go to law school. And it's so boring. If you want to dig into these dusty statutes, I want to know where all the juices and the blood are about these poor students starving to death and so on. And all you want to do is get out the law books and, and see what's there. That's what lawyers do. And I think it's good that we do make that because we want our, our, all of our officials to be in compliance with whatever authority they're granted by our representatives. Well, just to show you what it looks like, um, this is the statute that the court had to, had to look at. It's the student loan statute, which is called the HEROES Act because it was done right after 9-11 and it picked up that, that title as it went through Congress. So what does it authorize? president to do? Does it authorize him to cancel ten or twenty thousand dollars worth of a loan for any student with a lower income or not? That's the question. Well if you look at the um, the language here, what it says is the president may waive or modify waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision applicable to the Student Financial Assistance Program. When? When Congress says it's okay, when somebody else says no, and the President deems it necessary in connection with a national emergency. So here's a very careful piece of drafting. They identified the actions, modify, and waive, and they didn't limit those at all because it despised any statutory or regulatory provision. But it has to follow the President's judgment that this is a necessary because of this national emergency. So all those conditions are in this in this language. So what does the court do? Well, in an opinion um, by Justice Roberts, six to three, it's a number we're getting to hear a lot of. Um, he says, well, let's look at the language of the statute. It says the president can waive things 
and he can modify things. But this is not a waiver, this is not modification. This is a whole new program. Hundreds of millions of dollars of you know, cost us to do this. It applies to all borrowers and below the income line, not just some. And so I'm not sure that's a waiver or a modification. And you watch him, you go through this opinion and you see him sort of taking those two words separately. And he says, well, modify means it implies some minor, small, occasional change. It's not throwing the whole thing away and starting over. Um, and waiver, yes, he has authority to waive things, but he can't just waive a whole set of rules and then impose another set of rules and start a new system. So the court really looks at this statute and gives a, I think, a presentable analysis of what the words probably mean. And keep in mind that we're talking now about trying to discover what the intent of Congress was. And, you know, if you see a city ordinance that prohibits vehicles in the park, and somebody drives a bicycle in the park and gets arrested and, and claims that, oh, they didn't mean bicycles when they said vehicles, and you wind up in court. That's how those kind of things do. And then what the court has to figure out what the word vehicle meant to the people who wrote the, the ordinance. In this case, the people who wrote the statute. Well, how do you find that out? We talk a lot about it, legislative history and the intent of Congress and all that. Most of us, I think, no, particularly those, and you will, many people in this room in this situation as I've been in, we're in the middle of one of these things, and you know perfectly well there's no such thing as legislative intent. That is to say, there's no hand legislative, a single legislative intent. You've got hundreds of people in the room, they're voting up for this reason, for that reason. I voted for it because it's a good idea. I voted for it because my seatmate, Charlie, said I had to do it. He's going to support my bill next week. And somebody else said, I, I don't think much of it, but it's a, um, my, my party leader says we have to line up for this. So what is legislative intent? It, it doesn't exist in any plausible way. But we all talk about it as if, as if it does. Can you speak and, louder? No, no, no. I'm sorry. <coughs> this, this mic is just a little too short. I'll hold it up, maybe that'll be better. In any event, the court looks at this, Justice Roberts and his, um, five of his colleagues anyway look at it and say, I don't think this covers starting a whole new program. This is just a an authority to modify and waive minor, temporary, partial matters, but not starting a whole new program. And that's kind of when where the court comes out with this this case. And I think it's a I think a presentable kind of interpretation of the words. I think we find it reasonably plausible that modify and waive don't sort of imply you know, a major throwing away the whole system and starting a new one, which this looks a little bit like. Um, so I think it's a presentable um, interpretation. I wouldn't have interpreted it that way myself, but then you may have noticed I'm not on the court. Um, you, didn't, you didn't elect a president who would nominate people like me. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of, uh, I think, where this, this case comes down. The dissent, these three wonderful dissenters, and they are They take a, a more of a English teacher's approach to this interpretive question. They say, well, if you take the words one by one, yeah, it doesn't really sound like a big, a big program. It doesn't authorize a big program. But if you look at it holistically, if you look at all the words together, what is the general sense of it? And keep in mind that this is a response to an emergency, and by definition, you can't understand an emergency in much detail, so you want to give the person you're authorizing to act a lot of discretion, that depending on how the emergency works out. And so the dissenting judges say, we looked at it, we think they can read it holistically. Uh, it does cover this, this program. So we don't know, uh, but it seems to me that's a legitimate kind of discussion to have between two literate groups of people, and um, you may disagree with the particular view of the one, but it seems to me they're both at least plausible. Um, now, 
Joe Biden, as you may know, is a guy with great energy, and by the time this ink got dry on this opinion, he had a new plan. He called it Plan B. And Plan B is another whole new program which would put some limits on, we haven't seen the details yet, so I can't be very precise, but it'll put some limits on what percentage of your income you have to pay in payments, and it, it, it will sunset or, or get rid of um, some, some loans after a certain period of time. It's, it's gonna be one of those things. It's still gonna cost $400 million. I mean, it's not, it's not cheap, but it's um, something that I think um, is his next authority. So how can he do that? The court just said he didn't have authority. Well, again, you know, he asked his lawyers, how do I do that? And they said, well, there's another statute that authorizes you to foreclose loans or discharge them. Let's put this plan under that statute. That doesn't say waive or modify, it says discharge. And so that's what's gonna happen. And we don't know what that's gonna look like, how big it's gonna be, how much, how expensive it's gonna be, but my point is that nothing ever stays in one place very long in this, in this world. Uh, the, the loan program seemed to the Biden people at the time a good idea. Um, the court said, no, you can't do that under this statute. And he's right back there the next day with another plan under another statute, which is different, but aimed at the same objection. So keep in mind that the court is a, is a player in this, in this game in Washington, D.C. If they're not just sitting over there in that beautiful building pontificating on stuff. They are their players. And there are back and forth that happen all the time, not only between the executive and the court, but now and then between Congress and the court, and now and then between state governments and the court. There are a lot of players in this game, and it's a multi-faceted um, thing. Okay. I think the, uh, there's one element to this case that I, I want to mention because it comes up in a lot of cases tonight and uh, in, this, in this session. That is, how much deference should the court have for other people in the government? And keep in mind that when the president comes up with a loan program, it's going to cost zillions of dollars. And it, he's got it all spelled out, how, how long these things are going to last, and who's going to benefit, and all that. That is all very, very carefully studied by a lot of political people, and an, an army full of lawyers who go over and looked at the statutes and so on. So when this reaches the Supreme Court, it's not just a hunch that the president had. It's a very carefully thought out, very carefully designed um, uh, idea, and it is one that is in the, in the minds of the best lawyers they've got, and they've got some good ones, um, is well within the authority of this, this statute. So one question is, should the court, knowing that, knowing that this has been studied by all kinds of competent lawyers, uh, with lots, lots more experience than, than the president has, a lot more experience than the members of the court have, they've been working with these statutes for decades, many of them, should the court just say, well, you know, that's not the way I would have interpreted it, but these people probably know what they're doing, and it makes some sense if we're going to have a working government, that we should show some deference to the president's judgment, given all the advice he's getting from these experts. You don't see any of that in the Roberts opinion. He just decides that's not what the statute means and to him. That's the end of it. There's no, no discussion about deference to the president or respect for the office or understanding of the kind of, the kind of uh, background that this, this, this thing had. So that's something that you keep seeing a lot. I think it, it, I'm beginning to see a, a pattern in the, in the court at this point. It's that refusal to accord deference to other people in the government who possibly should be deferred to to some degree. That, that, you don't give up those, but some deference would be would be useful. Okay, let's uh, 
we could talk about that student loan program forever. But um, let's talk about affirmative action. We had a committee here a couple of years ago that I was on, and, and uh, a number of you may have been trying to sort out the horizon houses. Affirmative action, and I should, in, in the light of full disclosure, I should tell you I was one of the affirmative action soldiers back in the 60s. Um, I just started my law school teaching at the University of Washington after some other things, and um, when we began to sit around and look at our law school populations, and discovered that we didn't have any blacks in the law school. We didn't have any black teachers. We didn't have very many black lawyers. We didn't have very many black judges. And we discovered, I don't know why it took us that long, but we discovered that law schools are the, the gateway to this profession. And if you don't get into law school, you're not gonna wind up being a judge or a lawyer. Um, so we began to think about it. I say we, I'm talking about, I was on the board of a couple of national law school admission organizations. And we'd get together all, well, lots of meetings and express concern about this and how costly it was to us in terms of trying to run a law school that really worked well with a whole diverse student body and a diverse faculty and how the citizens had to run and to be in a, in, a, in a country that did not have a diverse judiciary. And so we decided that something ought to be done about it and this is not, this is just law schools, but medical schools were having the same conversation, engineering schools were having the same conversation, and lots of conversations around in the 60s. And so we decided that we we're gonna have an affirmative action program. So we went out one admissions year, and we admitted a couple of black students. Black was the, the color that we thought of as minority. It's a much broader concept today, but. Uh, if I say black, that's understand that's that's 1960s talk. So we set up a program and and we looked at the um, uh, the situation. What you what you see on the screen here is a, a graphic that I think shows you what kind of a problem we have. If you have all the applicants that apply to your law school in one pile, and let's assume they're ranked from bottom to top in terms of quality. And that's a whole another chapter about how we do that. It's done with test scores, undergraduate grades, evaluation of undergraduate cur curriculums, undergraduate majors, uh, interviews, uh, letters of recommendation, all kinds of things go into this. And the test scores themselves, we know because we wrote the test and working with all the fancy statisticians at Educational Texting Service in Princeton, we knew something about how Poorly, that test predicted much above all. Sort of better than even, but that's about as good as it gets. So we're not too concerned about uh, that being all that accurate. But we rank these people. In, in the, the next thing we do is find the right button. And we separate these the qualified from the unqualified. And every law school will draw this line in a different place. Standards vary among law schools and, and law school populations. So it's a, uh, but that's the kind of number that you have to do. People below that line are just not ready for our law school yet. Uh, they really have a heck of a time getting through, and when they got through, they might, might not be people who we want to be uh, all that proud of in terms of professional skills. So we draw this line. Everybody above that line is qualified, by which we mean if we let them in, we know they graduate, we know they do good work, and they'd be good lawyers and good judges. So that, that takes place. Now the question is, where are the minorities? And the minorities are scattered through the, the population like that. And it's, oh, well then if we want some more minorities, we just pick some in that qualified group. And that's all we gotta do. And then we're gonna have a little more diversity in our student body. But the problem is, and this is something that a lot of people never quite got a hold of, at highly selective schools, Harvard is obviously one, University of Washington is one. We get 3,000 applications for a first year class of 150, which is what, 5%. So we only take them off the very top of the stack, and doing that, we might not get any minorities at all. 
even if they're randomly distributed. We might get one now and then, but it's just a problem that we, we can't deal with without taking some other action. And the other action we decided to take at this law school and a lot of others is to go down below that admissible line and find a couple of minorities who are in the well-qualified status or they wouldn't be up there in the, in, the, in the ranking and put them up in our class and we'd have some minorities in the class. That inevitably means, since the class is fixed in size, that somebody in that class is now going to get bumped out of it. <coughs> it and it is kind of a zero-sum game. It didn't bother us very much because we knew these rankings were all kind of mushy anyway. And there wasn't much, very much difference between people who, uh, of the 3,000 people who ranked at, at 60 and people who ranked at 65. Eh, they're, they're, you know, we can't really say they're really different people, so we didn't worry too much about it. But we got ourselves sued, and uh, the trial court in Seattle said, you can't do that, that violates the 14th Amendment. And so they ordered us to admit this fellow who'd been excluded from the class. Um, which we did, and then of course the university appealed to the state Supreme Court, which reversed the decision. So the question came to the faculty, you know, what are we going to do with this guy? He's now in his second year, seems to be doing well, good citizen. Um, should we kick him out because we don't have to have him in there anymore? Well, we're teachers, not litigators, so we let him stay in. And we thought that would be the end of it. But his lawyer said, we're going to appeal the state Supreme Court opinion to the United States Supreme Court. And we said, that's okay, they'll never take your case because you'll be all, almost ready to graduate by the time this case gets up to the court. So the court will not accept the case. Well, they did. And we wound up full briefing, oral, ar oral argument, the whole schmear at the Supreme Court level. And at that point, you know, we had to go through all this work, and there were 25 or 30 amicus briefs that we had to help edit. And there were all kinds of newspaper articles about this case and about this problem. And we were very busy for a year and a half working. In, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big job to get a case up to the Supreme Court. We sat there at council table, and I was at council table. So I told my granddaughter, she said, have you ever been in the Supreme Court argument? I said, oh, yes. And she said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, I didn't have a very big role. You know, the Attorney General of the state, Slade Gordon, was arguing the case. We'd written all his briefs and ran him through all the drill to get him up to speed on this particular question. But he was arguing the case. And next to him at the council table was his attorney staff guy who did all his university work for him. And, uh, and then I was sitting next to him, you know, a brand new young uh, teacher. And at some point, Justice, Chief Justice Berger leaned over the bench and said, how large was the admissions committee at the University of Washington? And Slade looked at Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson looked at me. I said seven. And my grandchildren now say, that's the shortest oral argument in the history of the court. <laughs> <laughs> and they give me a, a special cup. The world's, the world's greatest granddad who made the shortest art, oral argument for the Supreme Court. And he's a big number seven in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Grandchildren, terrible. Uh, but my point is that we went through that whole drill, and, and then after that, the court dismissed the case on the grounds, surprise, that it was moved. But then you knew that. A lot of you guys on the bench went to law school. You know how long law school is. You know how long it takes the case to get up here. You knew it was going to be moved. But my reading of all that was that they just hadn't got anything like a consensus. They thought they might get one if they brought this case up. But they didn't, and so they ducked. And um, so they dismissed the case on the basis of moodness. So that case never went any place. That's the Funis against Odegaard in 1973, I guess. But and other than the fact that it was my one chance to argue before the Supreme Court, it doesn't have much significance. So after that, that the, the Funis case, there a whole series of other cases went up to the Supreme Court. The Bakke case, which came from a medical school in California. Um, the Gerter case, which came from, I think, Michigan Law School. And the Fisher case, which came up up, up until 19, 2015 now. These cases come along every several years. And in all of them, affirmative action was approved. 
I say approved. It, it's not that it was like Brown against the Board of Education, which was a unanimous opinion. We're going to have unanimous opinions in the affirmative action world because it's a very difficult thing for anybody to think about very, very carefully. It is a um, an activity that seems like the right thing to do, but it runs against our instincts that discriminating against people because of the color of their skin, that has to be uncomfortable for all of us. And um, so no judge, no collection of judges is going to get a unanimous feeling about that. The Bakke case itself, the first one that came up, there were six, at least six, maybe seven, opinions in the case. And you try and figure out what that means. One said, well, it's okay for this reason, it's okay for that reason, but not for the reason he said. And, you know, you have a collection like that and nobody really knows what, what the rule is. So it, it has come along up until the latest case before the one this year, being tried and tried and tried, people attacking the idea and the attacks having failed, not persuasively, but I think convincingly because you know, we had all these mixed opinions and different ways of looking at it and different ways of talking about it. So this case that arrives this, this term is a case that has a lot of history behind it. And if you look at that history, you discover that the kinds of approvals that the court has made since uh, the original Bakke case all the way down to the Fisher case, the approvals have been narrower and narrower as the, as the years go by. There's been less and less enthusiasm on the court for affirmative action. And affirmative action, of course, has never been popular with the public. It just seems like cheating somehow to take somebody out and put somebody less, quote, qualified because of the color of their skin. It just seems a lot of people just plain un-American. So it's never been popular with the public, that's why we got rid of it in the state of Washington, didn't we? In 1998, was it, with I-200? California had the same thing, Michigan had the same thing, where affirmative action is forbidden uh, in most states, like ours, uh, because people really don't, don't like it. So when the case comes up this term, you've got this long line of support getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and now we have a court with a little more conservative muscle than it had in the past. And maybe this is the time that you could expect something like this to happen. And it happened. And so they, you know, and some say, well, affirmative action was on life support anyway. It couldn't have lasted much longer. Indeed, the last opinion where it was, its longevity was discussed was the, the Grutter case in 2003, and Justice O'Connor opined well, this won't be necessary in 25 years. Well, that 25 years is just about used up. And many members of the court here said what she did was put a terminal date on this program, and that terminal point has arrived. We've got to get rid of it. So again, that's the, the history of affirmative action before the court. And what we don't know at this point is how broadly that attitude is going to spread. A lot of other things have happened in the states like Washington and California, which outlawed affirmative action. A lot of other things were developed by those states to come and help out. For example, they have much more aggressive recruiting programs. They have much more aggressive outreach programs. They have much richer financial aid. Um, they have targeted recruiting where they pick out particular people and go try and encourage them to apply. All those things cost money, and are, you could say is that if they're done for the benefit of minorities, they're in violation of this the same opinion that was handed down this term. So we don't know where that's going. We hope not very far. But the president of the University of Washington has said we're going to stay the course, keep doing what we're doing. And she reports that after I-200 was passed in 1998, is that about right? Um, the number of minority students in the University of Washington, not the law school now, but the University of Washington generally, sharply dropped um, from you know 5% to 3% or something. But then in the years since, with these other programs going on, the recruiting programs, the financial aid programs, it's starting to creep back up. And she's hopeful that it's, you know, this opinion which came down this term is not gonna cause 
um, catastrophic loss in, in the diversity of the University of Washington. Uh, people in the law schools had a similar kind of experience with um, the uh, drop off in minority applicants. And um, so it's, a, it's something that I think it, it'll be around for a while. You're going to see lots of things happening. It's possible that um, there's some give in the opinion in this case that allows something like race to be considered in some fashion or other. And uh, if I can get this statement. This is a statement from um, the Roberts majority opinion. It's not well, you can't see it yet, can you? Now, if you read this carefully, this is going to be gone over with a fine tooth comb by every admissions officer in the United States. What can we really look at in terms of race? And I think what you see here is a very careful statement that yes, you can still consider the race of an applicant if, but only if, you're focused on what race has meant to that particular applicant. And this will be what every university in the, in the country is going to try and stretch as far as they can to, to get into this, uh, in this business. So we don't know where it's going to stop. It may just stop with university admissions and, and not get spread into employment and other kinds of places where affirmative action is also um, employed. I, I, I think it has to spread. I think that's going to be the risk. And um, so it may be that universities and, and employers and other kinds of people who want to have a diverse population can find ways to, with economic analysis and other kinds of things, uh, sociological evidence about applicants might be able to find the diversity they want. Um, but if race is part of the discussion, and it's going to have to meet this particular standard. What is it about this particular applicant, the race of this particular applicant, that gives him or her a reason to be advanced over somebody else with nominally higher test scores? That's going to be the question. It's going to be a, it's going to be a battlefield. Okay, um, we're going to run out of time here. We keep rambling along. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, racial gerrymandering. This is one of the cases that surprised everybody because Justice Roberts was the guy who um, wrote the opinion in the Shelby case a couple of years ago and cut the heart out of the Civil Rights Act. Do you remember that? I don't know if you remember that case, but the Congress decided this doesn't work to have it possible for someone who walks up in the polls on the election day and say, I'd like to vote. And be told, no, we adopted a rule yesterday that people of Danish extraction can vote. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, that's illegal. They say, it probably is. So what, what's your remedy? Well, the next day, you go down and find a lawyer, you file a lawsuit, and God knows how many months, years go by before you get it litigated. And meanwhile, the election's behind you, and those people have been serving in office all those months. It just was not a practical remedy, a good principle, but no practical remedy. So Congress said, well, we can fix that. In states that have, have a practice of restricting voting, you can't change your voting rules unless you send a copy of the change you want to make to the Department of Justice and get it cleared. So that way, they take the practical problem out of it. So a lot of states, mostly southern states, uh, had to get pre-clearance for any change they wanted to make in their election laws in terms of qualifications or whatever. Well, the court in Shelby County said that's unconstitutional. And Justice Roberts wrote the opinion. It took that major tactical device out of the the, uh, uh, out of the, the Voting Rights Act. And so the, the Voting Rights Act was not nearly effective, uh, as effective with that gone. So he was going to be now a Chief Justice, in this case, from, comes up from Alabama. Um, and it turns out that the Alabama <coughs> line drawing, in fact, let me remind you about If you have a state with nine people in it, 
and you're told you're going to get three delegates to send to Congress. And the only rule is, every, each of the districts you draw has got to have the same number of people. Okay. So then the question is, how do we, how do we draw these lines? There's one way to do it. And if you draw it that way, what are you going to have? Well, you're going to probably have two congressmen who are Republicans and one who's a Democrat. And that seems to most of us be about the same proportion as they are in the population, and that would be okay. But the engineers um, say, well, no, we'd like to draw the lines this way. Now notice, nobody has changed. Nobody has moved. Nobody has changed their position. Nobody has changed parties. Everybody's exactly in the same place they were before. The only difference is the lines. And all of a sudden, the Republicans who had, you know, six-ninths of the power in, in the first example, have now 100 percent of the power. And, um, and you can do that same trick with race. You can have, if you had, your people were like that, you can divide it this way and say, well, that's okay. There'd be two representatives who would cater the preferences of white people, and one representative would cater the preferences of black people. And that's okay, because that's about the percentage they have in the, in the uh, state. Or you could draw it this way. And again, you've got the same problem. Now there's 100% white uh, representation, and uh, the blacks have no representative at all. Nobody's changed their views, nobody's changed their race, nobody's changed their location. Just the only thing that's changed are the lines. Well, there are people who've figured this trick out and figured they, look, we could really make hay here. And I think there are many, many people in the state legislative level who have been playing this game for a long time. Most of these lines are drawn by legislative bodies. And you can see in this sort of thing what happens if you are you have the majority vote in your legislature, you get to decide where the lines are. And, um, and so you can squeeze down your opponents, either by squeezing them into a smaller number of districts, which we call packing, or dividing them up and spreading them around other districts where they have no majority vote, we call that cracking. And so it's a, it's a game that can be played. And these days, with computers, I'm serious now, the court, in this case we're going to talk about from Alabama, looked at over a million maps. Because you can make a map by just pushing a button on whatever app you've got, and then say, well, we'll divide it up any way you like. So there it is, and it's a, um, uh, it comes up from Alabama, and Alabama is a state with 27% black people, and only one district is a majority black district out of seven. So the blacks have one-seventh of the congressional power, and they have 27% of the population. And the court says that's not a good idea. That violates, that's racial gerrymandering, which we cannot tolerate. Now, last year the court threw out a case in which somebody raised the possibility of having political gerrymandering, and the court said, we don't want to do that. We don't want to get into political gerrymandering. It's too fraught with debates and arguments and stuff, and in the long run, the parties will work out okay. Not true, but that was the thing. So we stay, out, stay away from political gerrymandering, but racial gerrymandering, because of the language in the, in the uh, Voting Rights Act, that you cannot deprive someone of a right to vote on racial grounds, the court said, yeah, this is a violation of that right. So I think you've got a, again, a, 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 a narrow opinion, five to four, um, and it is one that I think a lot of people were surprised by because they expected um, Roberts, having been the, the culprit in the, in the case a couple of years ago, uh, now seems to be a little bit on board. It's a very thin margin, five to four, and one of the four um, didn't seem all that convinced if he gets another swing at it somehow. Um, so they send this case back to Alabama and say, give us a map, we've got 8,000 maps that we've drawn that show you how to do this and have two black majority districts. There'll be two black representatives in the state of, from the state of Alabama, and that's what justice required. And what happened? Well, Alabama, you may have been reading this. This case just came down a couple of weeks ago. But Alabama's always filed, already filed a map 
that still has just one black um, majority district. And they say, well, this this is sort of what the, what the court asked for. Um, I think we, we raised the, the uh, it's, it's not a black majority, but we, we raised the black population in this second district from 30% to 40%, and that helps them a lot. And therefore, uh, we're going to go ahead, even though the Supreme Court said, I want two districts, um, or something very like two districts. And Alabama just thumbed its nose and has um, come up with this other map. It's now before a three-judge court in the next couple of weeks, and we'll rule. So we'll have to see how that happens. But it is the case that uh, the court can, uh, when it sees genuine injustice of this kind, it can uh, take action. That was a it was one of the good cases this time. That is to say, a case that a lot of us agreed with, which is the way we define good, right? Um, <laughs> being wholly objective. Um, let me just raise one more case, because it's really kind of interesting. Uh, and this, I think, is a kind of scary case in a way. It's about protected wetlands. Um, the Clean Water Act gives the uh, Secretary of EPA and, and the Corps of Engineers authority to protect wetlands who are terribly critical to habitat for animals and other kinds of environmental things. Water purification, flood control, you can go on and on. And these wetlands have to be protected because if you start dumping stuff in them or start building on them, uh, you might lose those, those benefits. So, the statute here says that the agency has authority to regulate, quote, waters of the United States. Um, and so that's, and then also says, it also has authority to regulate wetlands which are near waters of the United States. It doesn't use the word near, it uses the words adjoining or adjacent or something like that. But uh, not actually the waters of the United States. The water of the United States would be a, what you and I would call a river or a lake or something like that. And these wetlands, how close do they have to be to this lake or river before they come under the jurisdiction of the, of the uh, EPA? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Um, uh, Socket was their name. And they have a house in Priest Lake, Idaho, about a hundred feet from the lake. And they think they didn't think it was covered by the PPA, so they were able to start building on it and they started filling it with gravel and stuff. And they were told by the EPA, no, you can't do that. It's uh, that's covered land under under the statute. And so you have to stop doing that. And this is very serious business, forty thousand dollars a day fine for continuing to dump gravel on that piece of property. Plus criminal possibilities. So they litigate, obviously, and it winds up for the Supreme Court. And I think it's a, uh, one of the true unanimous cases this time. And it's unanimous because four of the judges said their land was not close enough to the lake to be part of the, considered as wetlands near enough to the lake. Um, and three other judges said, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, even if it's not, not covered, it's still not within the, the jurisdiction of the agency for some other reason. So all nine of them decided that Mr. and Mrs. Sackett were going to be able to build this piece of property. And just to give you a sense of what the, what the situation is here and how political this is, they filed their first permit in 2004. Now they can build according to this opinion. That's what, about 20 years. And that 20 years has been a cyclone of litigation and other kinds of political stuff. There have been three different presidents. President Obama had a BPA rule that the court set aside. And then his successor, Mr. Trump, had an EPA rule that a court set aside. And then President Biden had a BPA rule that was um, wasn't set aside, but it was reversed by Congress under the Congressional Review Act, and and he vetoed that reversal. So you can see that this is not a 
an easy answer. And every president's going to have a different view, every EPA administrator. And so the Sackets watched three presidents and 13, 13 EPA administrators in the 20 years they've been litigating this thing. And you can't tell from one day to the next who's in charge of what the result's going to be. This court said um, that their land was not covered. And all the judges agreed for that, but different reasons. But it is the case that the result of this uh, shrinking of the kinds of lands that the, the EPA can protect is, is massive. And this definition, I think what the principal opinion says is your land is not subject to the jurisdiction of the EPA unless it's actually touching the lake. And by touching, he said, Alito said, you have to be able to see a stream of water when you can't tell where the lake ends and the wetland begins. And if, it, if it's that close, then it's okay, it's, it's covered. But if it's 100 feet away, you, you can build what you want. And, uh, and a lot of hydrologists and other people who are experts in this business would say, well, lots of land that's 100 feet away can do serious damage to a lake or a river because of the way water flows underground in all kinds of different directions. But if the rule now is land is covered only, if it's uh, actually touching the lake in that sense, then the jurisdiction of EPA is radically re re reduced and the amount of protection that's going to be available for wetlands is going to be accordingly reduced. Um, well, we're going to run out of time here. I would like to have um, um, time for some questions. Um, the one case that I haven't gotten to yet is the uh, web designer page. We keep having these cases from photographers and florists and wedding planners and people like that who say, look, I know there's a law in this state and most every state and a federal law as well that prohibits me from discriminating against people on the basis of gender identification, but I don't want to have a website in which I have to, I'm compelled under pain of being convicted under that law, of designing a website for a same-sex marriage because that violates my religious principles. So we've had cake makers and florists and photographers and everybody uh, raising these kind of questions, and this is just another one. Um, and the court here, said this web designer did not have to comply with the Colorado anti-discrimination law. She could announce that she was not going to do any websites or any weddings that involve same-sex marriage. And, and the theory was not that it, like the other cases with photographers and florists, that this would interfere with her religious rights. When the court said, I, none, none of us can really understand that yet, was that it in, infringed her rights to free speech because she's compelled to express a view that she doesn't agree with. And so the First Amendment says you can say what you want to say, and also you don't have to say what you don't want to say. And she was being required to say what she didn't want to say. A lot of us think that's a kind of a, not, not a silly argument, obviously, but you know, there's no reason why she couldn't go ahead and do a website and just say at the bottom, um, I do not in any way endorse what this client is doing. That's not part of the drill here. Or she could have another employee design it. Or she could have an independent contractor design it. We've got examples of those around in here, other places. So, but she didn't want to do that. She wanted to announce on the website that she would not do a website for same-sex marriage. And uh, the court said she's free to do that because otherwise it compels her to express something that she doesn't, doesn't really believe. And that, I think, is a very strange uh, outcome. Um, so, well, the, before we get to questions, I do have one case I'd like to... Um, <laughs> now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I know there are people in this room who know what that is. <laughs> and notice, it's, uh, it's Jack Daniels, Sour Mash whiskey. It's 
a square bottle. It's got a black label on it, which is also square. The words Jack Daniels are kind of arched over there, Jack Daniels. And then it has something about old, old number seven, sour mash whiskey. Well, there's a company that makes dog toys. And the dog toys, somebody in that business said, you know, it would really be funny if we got a dog toy that looked like Jack Daniels. And there it is. It's a, it's a plastic dog toy. It cost you about 20 bucks. But the name, Bad Spaniels, is kind of like Jack Daniels in it. And it's art, so there. And it's got the same square black label. And then the thing that really makes it funny to the designers was instead of seeing old number seven sour mash, this is old number two on your Tennessee carpet. <laughs> Well, you can imagine when the Supreme Court discussed this case, <laughs> the exquisite sophistication of language they used to avoid saying anything unseemly. But the lower court said, that's okay. That's just, it's fair use. Nobody, no consumer would ever believe that this was done by Jack Daniels or that it had any reflection of Jack Daniels. Uh, so the lower court said it was okay. The Supreme Court reversed unanimously. And I think it was the old number two on the Tennessee carpet that probably <laughs> gave the thing a, uh, an aroma that the court was not comfortable with. So they have said no. Um, Jack Daniels was not amused by this joke and they have to start making this. I just, I cite this one case just to let you know that some of these cases you now and then can get a laugh out of. Um, okay, I think I'm going to quit there. There's much more we can do. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. So, we have mic runners here, Jan and Bill Korsner, and I've told them not to give the mic to anybody with a hard question. <laughs> um, Bill, on the affirmative action cases, um, there seems to be some assumption by the pl plaintiffs that there is an objective way of ranking applicants and that if, if you say that uh, you're discriminating against the ones who are higher ranked by taking race into account, um, that, that it's violating uh, that idea of, of an objective ranking. You're, you're absolutely right, and there is no such thing as an objective ranking of I mean, these people. <clears throat> We've been around with the most complicated statisticians in the, in the world on this one. And you keep coming to the point where, as I said earlier, all you get out of a standardized test score like that is a better than even chance. Uh, and uh, that means that any, anybody ranked 10 or 15 slots above or below is, is, is about the same as you. And so these cases don't have any objective standard. If they did, then that, that would be different. But every, nobody believes that. I think it's, uh, they believe that when they're ranked test scores and grade points, that must mean some sort of inviolable ranking. And so if you adjust that at all, you're doing some terrible thing. But people in the business know that that just ain't so. And uh, so, Mike? Do you believe the uh, Supreme Court should be subject to a code of ethics adopted by Congress or by the court itself? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's unlikely that Congress would pass, and if it passed, the court would welcome um, a congressional a legislative. Uh, I mean, it is the case that we've seen some scandalous, I think scandalous, yeah. kinds of things. Judges. Judges in Seattle, if you, if you say, I'll take you to lunch, no, 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 you can't take me to lunch, I'm not look good. But these people go off on these fancy vacations and all that stuff, it's just, it's just unseemly is what it is. And so I think it, there ought to be some regulation. I don't think the Senate would, would pass one. Whether Roberts can really get it done or not, I don't know, but I, I wish, I hope he does. And because uh, the courts have to retain personal respect, even if you don't respect their political view. Uh, the respect for the judges, I think, is really important. 
Did I understand you correctly in the beginning of your talk that you said it was the Supreme Court that decided from the 8,000 cases that were presented to them, which ones they were going to um, let come before them? Yes. Well, it's isn't entirely that in itself partisanship? Well, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And I, but I don't think there's been any effort to try and find a, a different way to do that. Um, well, they will choose the topics that they feel the most strongly about. I think that's right, and, and that they think there's a chance of getting some consensus on the court. And that's a function of looking at the pleadings and the facts in the case and a lot of layers of stuff that go into that. But, um, there yeah. must be a better way. Well, maybe there is, but nobody's come up with one yet. You might keep in touch with one of them. <laughs> you can think of something, huh? So, Joe, uh, as the owner of the toy company, dog toy company, don't I have a First Amendment right to do a parody of Jack Daniels? Stay away from the carpet missing stuff, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know much about parody. That's a bright line, no carpet missing parodies. <laughs> okay. I think parody is a recognized exception to trademark law. And, uh, but I think it has to be one in which the customer cannot be confused as to where the product came from. And, uh, and do something that discourages the, the product like this one is. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of friends on the court. Well, you found them in lower courts, but um, other questions. It is not okay. Okay, uh, I'm deeply concerned about the the deference that the court is increasingly showing to uh, what, what they would call a religious belief as opposed to a belief I would have not, not religious. And it almost looks to me as it's all right to be bigoted and everything else as long as you claim it's your religion. And I'm really concerned of how the, the court seems to be deferring to some broad notion of religious belief that somehow that trumps everything else. I agree with you very much, Gordon. I think that in what we've said in this series of talks the last two or three years, we've seen a growing use of that, that thing. Most of the religious versus other interests are balancing cases. But the weight given to the religious side of the equation keeps getting larger and larger. And I think we're going to see that a lot. I think it's a bad idea, too. And I don't know what to do about that. Uh, maybe you don't let religious people get on the court. Um, they're all religious now, and that's, and that's uh, so. Other questions? One down there, Bill. My question is about Alabama. Can they defy the court? Does the court have any repercussions uh, where the state's rights come into that versus the right of the government? That's a very good question. I think if Alabama comes up with a plan, that meets most of what the court asked for in its opinion. There are probably some members, and as I say, it was a very thin majority, and so one, one of them had a concurring opinion that said he wasn't very enthusiastic about the idea either. So it seems when they come up with a plan that's almost as good, they might get that through this court, uh, which is kind of too bad. But, um, but Alabama cannot do something that the Supreme Court says is illegal. So, but, but, the court has said is it's illegal in this fashion, and you come up with another fashion, it might be a different answer. But, uh, that's yeah. amazing. Yes? Bill, as a uh, foreigner to this country, I'm curious to know how does the court discuss cases and do they debate? Do, how, what, is, what is their working format? That's, that's a good question, and I, I, I don't know much about it. You have to kind of be a clerk inside the court and at one of those conferences to know kind of what they do. The rest of it, the rest of us who are outside just have to make guesses based on the kind of snarky thoughts that get expressed in footnotes here and there. <laughs> and you might think there was a problem, but I don't know, and it's, uh, it's highly secret. Uh, 
unless they release them into my dogs. <laughs> no, nobody's yet figured out what caused that. But I think the, the point is that there has to be some privacy where they have to sit around and decide what they're going to do. And uh, so that's not an open, uh, there are no cameras in the room and uh, no recordings in the room. Uh, oh, but now you get a, a tell all book by a clerk. Say, wow, well, you know, you should see the way this guy shot at that guy. Uh, that doesn't appear in Bill? any fish on it. Yes? Yeah. Do you believe that we should have term limits on the, on the court now? Longevity has increased significantly. And so when you have somebody nominated at 50, they could be there 50 years, theoretically. I agree, Sue. And I think there ought to be some kind of term limits. It's, it's very difficult to get that done. But I think there's some good plans around that are, that are doable. It's, uh, you know, we have term limits in the state of Washington. Our Supreme Court justices have to retire at age 75, I think. Um, so it's not unheard of. But uh, you couldn't make them retire under the Constitution because they have life appointments. But you could transfer them to another court. And I think... Would that take a change in the Constitution? I don't think it should, but again, the court will decide is the problem. <laughs> Other questions? Um, on affirmative action, um, it seems like the approach of the court is very atomistic. They're individualistic. They're just looking at charities from um, one applicant to another. Is, is there any consideration given to the fact that the college is trying to make up a class which has enough diversity in it so that the um, students are, are being exposed to various points of view and their education is being enriched by um, the makeup of the group that they're part of. Well, certainly diversity is a very valuable uh, situation in an educational school, in an institution. And everybody knows that. I mean, that's, that's never debated. The question is how you reach that diversity. And if the diversity requires that you have a higher component of people you can identify by race, then you've got this constitutional question to confront. And uh, so I think if you can find some way to do it without focusing on race, or focusing on only in the sense that this quotation of Robert's opinions indicated, I'd say it's fine, but diversity is a terribly important thing. Not only in the school, uh, in my business, diversity in the, in the population of lawyers is very important. Clients are entitled to have somebody that looks like them, somebody they trust, somebody that knows their problems. Same is true in medicine. And I think the evidence there is pretty clear that the more minority doctors you have, the better the health care people have. So I think it's a uh, diversity is terribly important. And if it involves race, you just have to be very subtle about how you manage it uh, because of this other set of considerations that seems to be built into our, our Constitution. If you'd like to read something really interesting, read uh, Justice Sotomayor's dissent in the affirmative action case. She really tells it like it is. And, um, it's really important to see that view s s stated. She takes the position, she starts from the position that the Constitution is not colorblind. That's a, that's a fiction. And we've had all sorts of governmental action from the 14th Amendment on, which takes action on the basis of race, was intended to and has. And she said it's a, it's a phony argument against diversity. So, but um, she's outnumbered right now, but she still writes good stuff. Other questions? This question is not really about the, uh, the court. What is an impeachment? Of a, just, a justice? Well, that someone was suggesting that our president, president be impeached. Well, president, any, any officer can be impeached. But I don't know what impeachment means. Does it, does it take away their degree or? <laughs> well, if you impeach, we've had, a, I think, a Supreme Court justice has been impeached somewhere in our history. Yeah. And they were misbehaving and I don't know what the procedure is for impeachment of a justice, but there's probably some panel set up to do that. We've seen impeachment of presidents um, here and there. 
appropriate. But I'm not sure I know what the sanction yeah. would be. If someone is impeached and they're convicted of, of the offense, um, then I think they couldn't sit on the court. Uh, incidentally, for what value this is, which is about what it'll cost you, I think that the, after George Washington observed that selecting justice is one of the most important things a president can do, with that in the air, I think that outsourcing the nomination to the Federalist Society is as close to high crime and misdemeanor as I can think of. But they didn't ask me. Good question. Thank you very much. You've been very patient. One more question. What is impeachment? Can you define impeachment? Uh, it's a, Your wife wants to know. <laughs> that, that is a serious trouble, Sam, as you know. Um, I don't know how to define that, but it, it, it's a proceeding to declare an official in violation of high crime and misdemeanor in the case of federal officials. And there has to be, after you decide to impeach, then you have to try it and convict, which is the next stage. And so it's easier to impeach than to convict. But once there's a conviction, I think the person is out of office. Now, that's my sense. But I'm not an expert in it. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you all. For, 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 for.